Hey there, I'm Kevin Delgado, a software engineer that works on open source Kubernetes here at Google. And today I'm gonna to take us through the life of a Kubernetes API request. The main focus here is to understand what happens when you type kube control create and pass in a Kubernetes object with the dash F flag. For example, what happens when you call create and pass in a YAML file with a single replica set object? This is targeted at people with some familiarity using kube control. And so while you might know what should happen when you run this command, maybe you haven't spent much time trying to understand how it actually happens. Here's the big overview of the main components we'll be looking at as we dive through the life of an API request. As alluded to before, our journey begins in the kube control command line tool. For many, this is the primary entry point for interacting with a Kubernetes cluster. From here, our kube control command gets packaged up into an HTTP request that gets sent over the wire to the kube API server. The API server sits at the core of the Kubernetes cluster in the control plane and is responsible for serving all requests for the many Kubernetes resources that a cluster maintains. The persistence of Kubernetes objects is handled by the key value store etcd. This is where the API server stores, in our case, the replica set object it has created. If you're familiar with Kubernetes, noticeably absent from this picture is any mention of the controllers that operate on objects once they're created, the nodes that actually run the containerized workloads, and many other components of the Kubernetes ecosystem. Those are all outside the scope of this talk, as we really want to focus and dive deep on the path an API request takes through the system. A fair warning that we are going to be taking a look at some of the source code that makes up each of these components. For clarity and brevity, the code is highly edited to emphasize the key pieces. At the top of each snippet is a path where you can find it in source. We're going to be looking at code from Kubernetes version 1.19.2. I'm well aware that a slide deck is not the best format to view code in, but looking at the code really is one of the best ways to trace through what happens to an API request. So starting with the kube control binary, the few big points we'll touch on here are the setup around creating the kube control CLI command, the actual execution of that command, the way in which we create an HTTP request and execute that request, sending to the ACE, sending to the API server, and lastly, the client-side serialization that takes place to encode the body of the request into a format that we can send across the wire that the API server can understand. The first thing that happens when you run any kube control command is that all of the kube control commands get built. Kube control uses a, CLI, a Go CLI command library called Cobra, and in the example on the left, we see that to build the specific kube control create command, we generate a new Cobra command populating some of the documentation fields with things like what help info we want to get from the command, but most importantly, telling it how to run via its run field. And when this is invoked, it, it, it calls a method run create on some options, passing in something called a factory. What is this factory? Well, it's basically some drop in abstractions that are used when executing kube control. For example, we use the factory to get the various clients, such as the REST client we need to make REST calls. We also use this factory to retrieve something called a builder that we'll take a look at next. That run create call we saw in the run method of the Cobra command is what gets called when we want to execute the kube control create command. After doing some initial setup, the factory creates a builder. Now what this builder is responsible for is taking the data that you pass in via the dash F or dash K flags which is usually a YAML file of one or more Kubernetes objects, unpacks it, and turns it into an iterable list of objects that for each object will have a generic REST operation performed on it. This happens by calling visit on the resource created by the builder, and for each resource it visits, which in our case might just be the one replica set, if that's all we passed in via the dash F flag. And for each resource, it creates something called a helper, and then calls the generic create on that helper with the object in question. The helper is just a structure that helps that provides methods for running generic RESTful operations. It has methods post, get, list, delete, etc. that all map to corresponding HTTP operations. This helper executes the HTTP request. In the case of a post request, like we see here, a big part of that is building the body of the request, and we'll take a look at that next. As we saw, the helper uses its REST client to build and execute a post request. The REST client lives in Client Go, which is the same Go library that you would use if building some external program to interact with the Kubernetes cluster. Prior to sending the, prior to sending the request, it builds the body of the request from an object into the format that gets sent across the wire and understood by the API server. As you can see, the REST client accepts a number of formats, string, bytes, IO reader, 
But if you're using the helper like we're doing here, then the body is going to be created from a Go Kubernetes object in memory and must be serialized into the proper wire format. For that, we'll take a look at some interfaces from the API machinery runtime package in just a moment. The last step is to actually send the HTTP request across the wire, which, which it does via the do method using a vanilla Go HTTP client. That then gets the response back from the server and bubbles it up to the user in the format outputted by the specific cube control command. Here, we see the interfaces for serialization that get implemented by auto-generated API machinery code. This serializer interface is just an encoder and a decoder. And as you might expect, the encoder is responsible for converting a Kubernetes object ghost-struct in memory into the canonical wire format to send across the network to the API server. And likewise, the decoder takes that wire format and converts it back into a Kubernetes object in Go that lives in memory. A few really interesting things happens here though. First of all, Kubernetes accepts multiple wire types, JSON and protobuf. You'll notice the negotiated serializer, which like the regular serializer, offers encoding and decoding, but serves as an abstraction around the multiple supported media types. So not only in JSON and protobuf, but also, but also some more encoding options like content type header or JSON pretty printing. You'll also notice the encoder 4 version, version and decoder 2 version, where we can get an encoder or decoder that are, that are aware of how to serialize for a specific object version. Further, you'll see that a codec is the exact same interface as a serializer. The difference is that under the hood, a serializer will not modify the Kubernetes object being encoded or decoded while a codec can. This is useful for understanding when, when looking at how the API server handles the request it receives. This serialization library straddles both the kube control client and the API server, and on the server side, is responsible not only for decoding the wire format, into a ghost struct, but also for converting the object to the right version and defaulting any fields the server requires. The idea behind conversion is that other clients is that older clients are expected to be able to communicate with new API servers. In order for these older clients to continue to work, the codec can encode or decode an object to or from a different version. So something like so something that is v1 on the wire could be v2 in memory or vice versa. There's also the concept of an internal version so that the server or storage clients only need to know how to deal with a single version and the codec can convert from one version to the internal version and the back to a different version if needed. Similarly, older clients may not be aware of new API fields and yet these API fields might be mandatory or only accept certain values. With this machinery, newer API servers are able to default those fields on requests that come in from older clients that might have the fields absent. Finally, when we talk about the ghost struct of a Kubernetes object, what we're talking about is a ghost structure that satisfies the runtime.object interface. That means that all Kubernetes API objects, replica sets, pods, services, etc., must implement this interface. You'll see this runtime object type all throughout the code. This interface used to be just one function called is a runtime object that didn't do anything other than signal if a struct was an API object. Now, there are a couple functions that help remove some of the need for reflection and makes operation of the API machinery code much more efficient. So that's it for the kube control client. Now that we have a request on the wire, it's time to take a look at what happens server side. Within the kube API server, we'll take a look at the API server aggregation layer and then see how the API server gets set up and configures routing and dispatching to the right endpoint. And then we'll take a look at the business logic of how the request is actually handled. And lastly, we'll dive into how the newly created object is persisted to etcd. The way the kube API server gets started is actually itself a Cobra command too. Like all Cobra commands, it has a run function that is called when executed. This run function kicks off a helper function that creates the server chain. The server chain aggregates an extension server with the kube API server. The API server aggregation is fairly new to Kubernetes and provides some pretty nifty customization. Aggregated API servers let you do things with your API server that you wouldn't be able to achieve out of the box or even with custom resources, such as using a different storage API instead of etcd. That aside though, for creating a simple replica set, all we really need is a kube API server. The kube API server that gets created holds all its state in a struct called a generic API server. In addition to a lot of state uh, to a lot of state in creating the generic, API, the generic state API server initializes the handler chain, which is a series of HTTP middlewares that every request goes through that is responsible for various things such as authorization, cores, timeouts, or max and flights, 
and a handful of other functions. Additionally, we call install API on the server so that we can serve requests for all the various Kubernetes resources consistently. This API installation sets up the routing and dispatch so that request URLs get sent to the correct resource handlers. We'll take a look at routing and dispatch in a bit, but first we'll see how the API server actually starts serving. The generic API server exposes a run method that gets ran when the API server is invoked. This sets up a shutdown delay so that the server can gracefully shut down when terminated and calls serve on the server's secure serving info, which sets up TLS and finally invokes serve on a vanilla Go HTTP server, which is the entry point for the socket to actually start listening and serving. Circling it back to routing and dispatch that we mentioned earlier, we use an API installer to register the actual HTTP handlers that process the request that comes in. That install H API method that we saw earlier uh, called when creating the generic API server it uses a library called Go RESTful for setting up a muxer that matches the request path with its proper handler. The way we configure the Go RESTful muxer is by starting with something called an API group version struct. API resources in Kubernetes are divided by group version. This indicates to the API installer which path these resources live at. It contains a variety of useful fields like a negotiated serializer for encoding and decoding into and from the various formats, as well as something called a storage which performs the various REST operations and wraps the actual client used to write to storage. When we use the API group version to register the resource handlers, we program Go RESTful to link a resources path to its handler for every given HTTP verb, along with some other things like giving us auto-generated open API documentation. The register resource handler snippet you see on the right-hand side is actually a huge several hundred line long function. As the snippet indicates, there's a switch statement with a case per HTTP verb that sets up a route to the given handler. So all we've seen so far is what gets ran when the API server binary is started. We're done with that now, and we've finally made it to the code that runs when an actual request comes through. Here in the create handler is what the HTTP is where the HTTP request gets handled. As you can see, we're using the decoder we've seen previously. This decodes the body from the wire format into the correct version of the go runtime object struct in memory that we pass on to storage. Another interaction that takes place here are the calls out to the admission webhooks. Admission webhooks are calls that the API server makes to external servers that perform an action on the object being handled by the API server. There are two kinds of admission webhooks, mutating webhooks and validating webhooks. The mutating admission webhook gets called first and modifies the incoming object, such as by adding custom defaults or annotations. And then right before storing to etcd, the object is passed to the validating admission webhook. This can reject requests based on custom policies external to the API server. Lastly, we actually persist the object to storage in etcd before returning the response of the request up the call stack. How this object gets persisted to storage is what we'll look at next. But take note here that it's under create call on something called a named creator. The last part of our journey here, we'll dive deep into how we go from the request handler processing the request body into the final state of the Kubernetes object to be stored and persisting and persisting that object to etcd. As mentioned previously, the request handler calls the create method on a named creator to pers persist the Kubernetes object to etcd. The named creator and the more generic creator are interfaces that map to the corresponding HTTP create method. There exist interfaces for each of the restful verbs, get, watch, create, delete, update, that act on a single item as well as a separate set of interfaces for each of these verbs that act on a collection of items. Implementing this interface is not trivial though. And on top of that, there's a lot of shared functionality between how the create method should work across all resource types, but there are also some differences. To take away some of this complexity, there's a built-in implementation called a store that in addition to holding the actual etcd client to fire off etcd transactions, takes in a strategy for each type of rest action that is specific to the resource being operated on. On the right-hand side, we see how the store implements create, utilizing the create strategy prior to actually executing the transaction. Thus, no matter what kind of object you are creating, it runs this create method that really only differs by the create strategy it uses for the specific object type. It then generates the etcd key before finally writing to etcd and calling after create on the object that has just been persisted. Before looking at the etcd3 storage client that executes the transaction, We'll take a brief look at the create strategy specific to the replica set resource. In general, a rest create strategy must implement the methods you see on the left. These are slightly different for each resource type, but as you can see in the unedited 
prepare for create, and validate methods on the right, the specific strategy for a resource is pretty trivial, as it should be in order to support the many different resource types that Kubernetes has. And the bulk of the work is done on the store that we just looked at previously. One aspect that we glossed over when going through API server setup was how the actual replica set strategy is installed on the cluster. Taking a brief step back, during API server setup, the generic API server is wrapped in something called control plane instance. This instance has an install APIs method on it that confusingly is different than the install API method on the API installer to set up routing and dispatch. This method wires together all the REST storage providers for every API group, such as auto scaling batch, and of course, the apps group, which is where the replica set storage provider lives. This is where we configure the storage options and set the replica set strategy that we took a look at on the last slide. Finally, the very last piece of code we'll look at is how the store uses the actual etcd3 client to execute the etcd request. Once again, we use a codec from the API machinery runtime package that is embedded into the encode call. While an API server can handle requests for many different versions, it writes all objects to storage as a single version. This enables more control over storage format upgrades and lets you roll back or roll forward versions. Here, the codec does that conversion before finally executing and committing the transaction and surfacing up any errors. And that's it. I hope you've gotten a better picture of now what happens when you make a Kubernetes API request, starting with the invocation of a kube control command and it's building an execution of an HTTP request that gets sent to the kube API server, handled, and turned into an object persisted to etcd. Thanks for taking the time to watch.